Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for welcoming us and for accepting our Poetry Collective to uh, present our work, um, one in a group, Silence and Invisibility in the Academy. The group is um, made up of, as you will see, um, Nicole Brown, who is here with us as well, um, myself, um, Mar Margaret Buchanan, Emily um, Sikora Cat, Erin Khoury, Mandy Haggard, Victoria um, Lynn, um, Peterson Hilke, excuse me, Victoria, um, Jenny Van Der Aert, Jenny sends her apologies, and Laura Warner. Um, so we came together um, as an international poetry group um, as a result of a, a wider practices research um, network uh, that actually Nicole set up. And then together, Nicole and I set up um, the Poetic Inquiry group as part of that. So we are an international poetry group and we are specifically for academics um, and students who are engaging with any form of poetic inquiry. What we hope that our uh, poetic inquiry group does, um, we set it up to create a space um, and to create opportunities to explore the role and the function of poetic inquiry um, through critical debate. In our meetings, um, works in progress are discussed and critiqued um, constructively. Um, and this particular collective, um, which has come together out of that poetic inquiry group is made up of, um, of women, nine women from the United Kingdom, from Ireland, the, the European Union and the United States of America. Um, and we, we set out to work together um, to, uh, on a collaborative autoethnographic poetic inquiry in order to examine what it means to be female to be a female marginalized in academia. Hello, I'm Mandy Haggis. Am I audible? Yes, you are, Mandy. Yes. Great. Um, so I'm I'm one of the uh, UK based um, members of the collective. I'm in um, I'm in Scotland, and um, the the group that we formed um, seems to have um, evolved into something which um, can best, I think, be understood as a community of practice. Um, the, a community of practice is, uh, according to Etienne Wenger's um, definition, a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something that they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. So Wenger has done really, really interesting work for decades about how people learn together. And the analysis that um, he has produced in his theory of the community of practice seems to fit very, very neatly with the experience that we've had as our own um, uh, collective. One of the things that has been, I've, I've worked with the idea of community practice for, um, for many decades as well, um, facilitating groups of people to learn together in various different ways. Um, one of the crucial ideas about a community of practice is that it's not simply about people participating together. It's also an issue of identity um, and the way in which a, a really successful community of practice um, involves all of the people changing not only cognitively but also in terms of of their their sense of identity as they become um, more and more close knit into that the community. And so there's an idea of of people coming together on um, inbound trajectories that they're coming from wherever they are initially within a wider landscape of practice and join the community by first of all discovering it and then um, doing what um, Wenger nicely calls peripheral participation. And um, it needs to be legitimate for people to participate um, in that periphery as they make their inbound trajectory in towards the, the heart of the community. The, 
Um, so poems have, as people come from their different places in the landscape, um, they need to overcome the boundaries between the different places that they're in. And those boundaries in our case are disciplinary, they're geographical, um, and they are also perhaps boundaries of um, experience with poetry. And poems are really ideal boundary objects that by discussing them and collaborating on them, we can align ourselves together um, um, through them. And the reason for that is because poetry um, has the particular ability to engage us both cognitively and in terms of our whole self, our whole feeling self, and therefore supports that co-creation of identity um, that is so central to the idea of the community of practice. And I think that the examples that we'll give you as, as we go on will show, I think, quite strongly the way that we've not only um, created um, poetry together, we've also created identities together as, as academics and as poetic inquiries. Hello, I'm Victoria. Normally I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota in the US, but I'm actually here in South Africa in my um, hotel room trying to avoid being backlit. So you have this glorious stripe behind me, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about our process. The nine of us um, were broken up into three groups of three and each group worked together over a period of um, at least six months where we were tasked with providing or creating at least one poem written together. Um, some groups produce more poems than that. And um, part of the beauty of having such a long period of time to work together was it gave us prolonged exposure, which we talk about sometimes in qualitative research as offering um, reliability and validity with not only with the audience, but in some ways, this is a work that really blurs the line between researcher and participant and audience because each group was in a way like an audience member to the other groups. And so all of us in this collective are playing the, all of those roles in some way or another. Each group generated its own method for data collection and analysis, and later will each group will speak to that, to the work that was produced and analysis of it. But all groups were applying autoethnographic approaches or the study of self and culture to merge lived experience with lyric voice, but we were doing so collaboratively and dialogically. So it wasn't just an independent self, but a, a collaborative collaboration among selves. And so all of us involved dialogue, reflection, and writing. And all of the groups were writing asynchronously apart and synchronously together. And um, each group used some form of technology, not only to meet over Zoom and send things over email, but also we used applications like Jamboard and Padlet and Google Docs to help enhance the collaborative nature of this endeavor. So one of the things that emerged across groups as an essential poetic tool was metaphor, but it varied between groups and the way it was used. So group one was really exploring the idea of a map of a university. And they were looking at the way space would shape voice by housing poems as if they were in different rooms in the academy, a library, a meeting room, an office. Um, there, were, there were four different poems that the group decided on a guiding, mem uh, guiding metaphor for each poem, but then they um, each individual wrote that, but it was bound together by a fifth center poem called Voice, and they had arrows going between the rooms. So they, I don't know if you'll get to see that in this presentation, but I'm sure they'd be happy to share it with you. Now, group two relied on um, a play or a drama as a metaphor, and they were evoking the voice of Hecate as a triple goddess, um, maiden, a mother, and crone, and a course. And so their poem looks like a play on the page with all these different characters. 
And then the third group used a metaphor um, of a confession booth as three white women um, working in the academy exploring the intersectionality of gender and race. And now you're going to hear from members of each group a bit more about process and the work. Hi there, my name is Erin Curry, and I'm uh, speaking to you today from Toronto. So I'll first read um, one of the poems that our group um, came up with. It's called Library. A muted tone, pressing the elevator button, gravity suspended, transporting to the fifth floor. Doors open to reveal passageways and towering authorities. Ants buried in books and databases under layers of fertile soil. Sound is muffled. Shifting and questioning is scarcely audible. Isolated between unspoken compartments, each knowledge seeker consumed within their own galaxy of promise. Interdependent in space and obtainability of what can be known, knowledge will be composed differently between today and tomorrow, past, present, and future becoming. Culture, discourse, and positionality unfolding. A silent and intersubjective knowing between warmed bodies in shared spaces and time on twilight missions and imposed life deadlines. I may need an extension. As you can see, I have a little furry friend here with me. And then the central poem, um, that Victoria was talking about was called voice. And so if you can imagine a Venn diagram of all of these uh, kind of university spaces together, this was what was kind of centered in the middle. Voice, number one, is one of those oxymorons, is literal and is metaphor. People hate the way their voices sound, the recorded message of one's own voicemail. People love the sound of their own voices. Many of my friends' fathers and my father's friends. Some people fit into these two categories simultaneously. There is a, Den uh, a Venn diagram here. I think I too fall into the crossover space. Then on reflection, I think I am actually two separate people who each sit in one of the larger circles. Number two, as in my own as a sound that I don't like, but that I use regardless because sometimes it has something of interest to say. Mostly, I'm talking while not wanting to hear what I'm saying. So maybe there is another circle. I don't like the sound of my own voice because I don't like hearing the words that come. Where does this circle intersect with the others? I should draw it to find out. Number three is now something to do with the privilege that this person has to choose whether or not they sound, they like the sound of their own voice. And also when we ask, does our choice assume an audience, an attentive audience? My privilege is to decide that I do not like hearing myself speak because I take it for granted that people listen to me. Number four is about being listened to. I don't like it when I speak to other researchers. I don't like the sound of my own voice because I know that they are listening to me and that their opinions of me may be altered depending on what I say. I do like it when I speak to other researchers because I know that they are listening to me and that their opinions of me may be altered depending on what I say. Number five, outside the circles is a big empty space. There's something here about the title of this Venn. Is it to do with having vocal cords that function or is it to do with having a voice? Sometimes I let the fear of using my voice take me outside the circles. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm uh, speaking to you from Devon in the UK and I'll just give a bit of commentary and, anal and analysis on group one. Developing our dialogic process through a series of meetings over Zoom, Group 1, Erin, Nicole and I worked through a cycle of discussion, followed by independent writing, followed by group discussion and so on. 
At our first meeting, we had a semi-structured conversation around the themes of voice and silence and what each of these words means to each of us in the context of the academy. We spoke of the intersections at which we sit, our common experiences as women and researchers and the differing experiences of our different career stages. Here we shared thoughts and responses to the demands that the academy puts on researchers, focus on output, uh, conventions around authorship and citation, as well as around the impulse to question whether one even has a place within the academy. Themes of feeling silenced by existing academic structures, as well as of self-silencing arose. Outside of this initial meeting and with our discussions in mind, we undertook free writing exercises from which we each derived a poem. These poems were shared in a Padlet. We read them independently and came back together to discuss them. We noted how poetic form was used to enrich the distinct voices of which we had spoken, such as the cyclical, repetitive Villanelle form of Nicole's Academics Lament. When read together, these pieces represented the beginning of a collection of voices that would present different experiences of silencing as felt at different intersections of research identity. We wondered how we might combine the poems without losing the personal perspectives, and this is where the Padlet came into its own. Seeing the poems alongside one another gave a spatial dimension to the voices present. We could see how the pieces spoke to one another, how they might each represent voice as it shifted between places and spaces within the academy, research office, meeting room, for example. We wondered what other spaces might host a voice that feels silenced, who might be speaking or silenced within them. Choosing to include the library and the classroom, we talked about how our reflections on voice and silence might play out. We shared metaphors, listed, shared and listed metaphors such as ants buried in books. We then went away and wrote. The final stage was to collectively shape and edit. Our piece, as Victoria described, became a representation of a campus map with poems situated in rooms and with the piece called Voice in the Centre a reminder of the omnipresent conflict between the desire to speak and the phenomenon of feeling silenced by structures outside of one's control. Read today by Erin, voice explores the perception of a do dominant or bright kind of academic voice with which one cannot identify. The speaker of the piece is unable to be sure where she should position herself in a Venn diagram of her own creation. There is here a sense that one must conform to a set of predetermined expectations that are elusive and inaccessible to all but those in the know. The fear is that by speaking, she'll be exposed as an outsider. Elsewhere in the library, silence operates as a condition in which the towering authorities of academia seem endlessly expansive, and the speaker's perception of her own knowledge is increasingly diminished. This leads her to conclude, I may need an extension. The humour of this final line implying that there may never be enough time to live up to the academic expectations. Academia is a lonely place in which competition and imperative to publish and the chasing of promotions are deemed necessary for survival is presented in the piece The Research Office and Academics Lament. Reflecting on this, I speak to the transformative experience of truly collaborative working as represented by our process of poetry as research. As a collective, we draw the attention to the impossibility of a single dominant voice to represent the academy. In our poetic piece, the university campus becomes a metaphor for the academy, the prevalent conditions that silence and the myriad of differing voices that do not and cannot identify with the perceived right kind of academic voice and so keenly feel the impact of voicelessness. But our piece offers hope in its co-creation and in its content. As the speaker of the meeting room concludes, who has the courage, who has the audacity to interrogate the rules, to recompose the harmony, to revolt against the silence? Through collaboration, we have produced voice and revolted against the silence. Hi, I'm Anya, and as I've already introduced myself, and I'm going to read the part of uh, The Maiden and the Crone from Working Class Hecate, and Margaret will read the, the part um, of the, of the uh, mother, and Margaret will introduce herself uh, next. Uh, when in the commentary and analysis. Working class Hecate. I am locked behind lifetimes of silence. Maiden, why am I flailing? Why am I failing to fill a space? I have my voice scrambled by lifetimes of silence. I know my voice 
What do you call a wall that stops sound? Walls inside of shh, islands. Damn my voice. I was silenced as a Marxist, Chrome. I was expected to fulfill a specific role. I was expected to know about gender. Gender is social class. I started to talk about Marx. The students wanted more. Blomhart, more Blomhart, more Blomhart, more Marx. I couldn't give them that. More business, more business. You cannot understand gender if you do not understand class. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. If you want a job done, ask a busy woman. Is that philosophy? The writer may very well serve as its mouthpiece, but he cannot, of course, create it. How can a silenced person serve as a mouthpiece? Why are the writer and he different? Can they not be the one and the same? I am not imagining my voice hits a wall. Profound thinker, serious scholar, contribute to knowledge in the field. I hide my motherhood behind these words. This is not my voice. My motherhood is not heard here. They cannot know my ways of knowing. I cannot love, I cannot caretake and still be acknowledged. Damage is done by the tacit understanding that certain aspirations are unsuitable for particular groups of people. So, she silences herself, having been silenced. As a maiden, she took heed. If you are silent, you cannot make mistakes. Institutional rewards for the right kinds of silence. I can pretend to be smaller until I can be bigger. I will be quiet now to find a way to be heard later. I cannot be alone in this, can I? To ask the question is to be wise. This is the maiden's trauma. To know you hide your own light, you buy into the system as a strategy. This is the system's violence. To recognize the voice of the maiden and pretend it isn't there. So the maiden waits for later, the trauma is in waiting. There is too much exploitation under capitalism to be submissive. Within those structures, you are bound to hit something. That has repercussions. Sometimes that's just how it goes when you stand up. I am a rebellious spirit, rebellious. Spirits are often silenced. In the Bible, it says, one has to be submissive to a bad boss. But I disagree with Paul there. These are our words. All of us, all of them. Um, I'm Margaret Buchanan. I'm joining you from Minnesota, Minneapolis. And I was part of group two together with Anya and Jenny. And I'm just going to briefly describe how we worked together, how we came to Hecate. It was through dialogue that we together agreed on the mythic voice as our vehicle. We harnessed myth as a way of going beyond the personal, we acknowledge that myth embodies that kaleidoscopic relationship between the personal and the universal. Myth and poetry both allow us to explore multiple truths on multiple levels. So following that, we settled on the archetype of Hecate because of the multiplicity of her aspects. Hecate represents this triple existence which we channeled to charter the various intersections at which we are silenced in our gendered roles. And it was through this exploratory process that we were ultimately able to name the structural inability of the academy, to recognize the complexities of our lived experiences and the silencing impact of this reluctance. Our approach has undoubtedly been led by the applied ethnopoetic analysis from the fields of linguistic anthropology and sociolinguistics. We listen to each other with an ethnopoetic ear. To listen with an ethnopoetic ear means to listen mindfully, with painstaking attention to the inherent poetics, structures, and prosody in the talk of others. Our poetics shaped our dialogue, and our dialogue birthed our poetry. 
We came to our dialogue with a poetic lens. We were introspective, critically reflective, and analytic of every exchange that passed between us, individually and collectively. Through this symbiosis between our dialogue and our critical introspective poetic analysis, we could finally name and articulate the impact of intergenerational silencing at the intersection of gender and class. Themes emerged through dialogue and the commonalities of our experiences were crystallized through the movements back and forth between dialogue and poetry. We now know academia does not recognize the inseparability of the intellectual and the emotional, the entangled and embodied experience of knowing, learning, feeling, and being. Academia does not recognize the impact of emotionality that comes from existing in liminal spaces. Those liminal spaces in which we all exist and within which we work. Therefore, we are doubly and triply silenced at the intersections at which we position ourselves and are positioned within that key academia. Thank you. And I'm Emily Sikora Cat. I am um, zooming in from uh, East Tennessee in the United States of America. And um, I will read uh, Group Three's collective poem, Whitewash. Whitewash, blank page as confession booth, pen as priest, I confess. I hold the word white in my mouth, feel the initial roundness of lips give way to tongue on teeth as if innocent. If wishing would help, I'd wish for a world of diverse people, all equal, all empowered, all vital. I'd wish for a world where my white, straight, able, middle-class heart wasn't the colonizer, wasn't worn on my sleeve, bleeding down my arms to my white hands, rattling the bars of my gilded cage of privilege. I want to wash the page with wishes, but cannot erase my power. Wishes are a whitewash waste of words that cannot cleanse blood. I confess, in the courtroom of the page, construct judge and jury between stanzas, indict the power of looking, the power of naming, power in inquiring, making, publishing a reputation, all for a centering I, subject to questioning, why can I, then should I, how can I without the I? I continue to sin in skin systems. I remember, then forget, then remember again, the easy amnesia of white privilege. Forgiveness isn't the wish, I confess. I've only begun to examine the shape of what it means to be a white woman, my mind a womb where no one can tell where oppressor begins and oppressed ends. This is Victoria. I had the chance to work on this poem with um, Emily and Mandy who read earlier. And we woke, worked collaboratively deciding to explore the intersectionality of our gender and um, race as white women working in academic institutions, different institutions that all are dominated by whiteness. And we really decided to weave together a poem of all of our voices, but trying to create create a, co a cohesive eye of all of us, despite individual differences and in perspectives on our relationship to gender and race and other identities. And so that was part of the challenge of revision to try to maintain our individual contributions while also having a cohesive eye. And you saw the spacing. Um, I think some of um, our thinking around that was that the white space on the page between lines and among lines could kind of hold some of the tension of the oppositional identities, whiteness being a dominant identity and 
feminine, our feminine or female identities being a more marginalized identity. And then also with what is said and not said. But we really wanted to try to give voice to the influence of what we kind of all agreed was a sense of the dominating silence over whiteness the, and our privileged complicity in that. And the confession booth became a way to kind of work through individually and then collectively as a guiding metaphor. But it shifted throughout the poem. The confession booth sort of shifted to a courtroom because confession booths felt like forgiveness. And we weren't really sure that that was where we were at, or at least not all of us. And then to a womb at the end um, where perhaps the sense of the evolution of our speaker was prepared to move beyond or birth into another state of being. Okay, so I would, um, I, I, I want to say um, thank you to my, um, to my fellow members of the collective. Um, it's been really the most wonderful um, experience working with you and being part of this community of practice as it formed. Um, just going back to um, Mandy's metaphor at the beginning, as we all moved on this inbound trajectory across the landscape. Um, and this, this community of practice really gave us um, many, I, I think we, we all agree that we were gifted um, by, uh, it gifted many things to us. It allowed us to center the poetic process, the process itself as inherently valuable, rather than just uh, the output, which is more traditionally what's valued um, in, in the, the, the academic field. It allows us, it allows us to, to explore our multiple individual and collective truths and, and find and create a space in which they could go, coexist and in which they could be voiced and our capacity to, to voice those uh, grew. So um, th we developed our capacity to voice our silences in this way, not just within that community of, within the community of practice, but we now uh, can go into the wider landscape of the academy and voice our silences beyond the confines of our own community of practice. And we feel that having worked together um, and, and created um, something um, while apart from poetry, uh, while we were working together, we have, we have developed a model um, for a community of practice for, uh, for poetic inqu inquirers, a model um, um, through which a community of practice can be, uh, can offer uh, the opportunity to learn about oneself um, and uh, for becoming, um, for learning about structural barriers uh, within the academy for, and for developing strategic and tactical resistance to that, that, that those sil the silencing that occurs um, because of those structural barriers, but also to draw on an earlier point that, that was made, uh, this has been a, a very hopeful um, endeavor. Um, and we didn't just, uh, although it's a very important um, and a powerful um, experience for us that we develop that strategic and tactical resistance. We also have, cre um, we have a model here for creating alliances which encourage and enable participants and shift the margins, um, which I think is, is really the, the most powerful and the most hopeful um, gift that we've all been given. Thank you very much.